Hi, everyone. Good morning. Happy Saturday. Happy May Day. Um, welcome to our presentation on eco-friendly pest and disease management with Suzanne Bontempo and Charlotte Canner from Our Water, Our World. Um, I, if I'm honest, I don't really feel like I'm working when these two are on here. It's so much fun and it's, uh, I'm, I'm so happy to have them um, presenting for us. I do have a poll going on. If you all can um, take, a, take a moment and go over and fill out the poll, we have some information that we'd like to gather before the presentation. Um, I also wanted to note that I, we're gonna take a break for next weekend for Mother's Day weekend. Um, so we won't have a webinar next weekend, but the following weekend, we're going to have Peppers 101 with Dan Alexander. And if you're at all interested in peppers, Dan is like the pepper master. And so it's, that's going to be a really fun, informative seminar or, or webinar. He like makes his own salsas and stuff. It's cool. Um, and then also remind you that you should have received a link to the outline for today's presentation, as well as resource handouts in the reminder email that you got about an hour ago. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A portion here. We're gonna reserve the majority of the questions towards the end of the presentation. Um, and so, and I'll be filtering through them and we'll go through them and try to address as many as possible. I also want to remind you that a recording will be available on the Tuesday after at any given webinar, the recordings are available the following Tuesday. So this should be available on May 4th. Um, and it's under the learn tab on our website and there's a video link. So, um, okay, let's look at the poll results and um, dive in because I know you have a ton of information you both are going to share. Um, okay, so 70% uh, of people have attended a slope webinar before. And so 30% have it. So welcome. Um, glad to have everybody here. And then most people heard through email about the webinar. And then, uh, let's see, the pest that they're most interested in learning about uh, is 83% wanna know about insects and 65% wanna know about fungus and disease. And 39% wanna know about weeds and then rodents is next and gophers and moles. So that's good information. 74% um, have not heard of Our Water, Our World before. So we're really happy to have y'all on here because this is a really incredible program that you need to know about. And so good to know. And then the people that have heard of our water, our world before has been from our webinars. So this is really cool. Thank you so much. Um, Suzanne and Charlotte, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Jen. We're really excited to be here also. And welcome everyone for joining us today on this beautiful Saturday morning, May 1st. Um, we're going to talk about eco-friendly pest and disease management. As questions come up, don't hesitate to, you know, put them in the, um, the Q&A. We will have time at the end to address them. So welcome. It's a beautiful day. So we're going to go through slides for, um, I say 45 minutes, but I think it might be closer to an hour because we have a lot of content that we really want to share with you. And it's going to primarily be about pest management. Uh, we're going to be diving into those pests that we commonly see in our garden. We're going to review the principles of integrated pest management or IPM. We're also going to review how to set our gardens up for success. Now, this is just a review. So for the 30% of you that haven't 
joined a SLOAT webinar before, um, please go back to the archives and have a look at some of our past programs because you'll see where Charlotte and I have really, um, we dive in a lot deeper with the cultural control. So this is just going to be a quick review for us. And then we're going to talk about how IPM plays a very large role with reducing pest problems around the garden. And then we're going to uh, look at how we apply these techniques and strategies to manage pests and diseases. So the Our Water, Our World is a program that uh, is designed to bring awareness between pesticides and water quality. We are uh, throughout the greater Bay Area, Northern California, Central California, far as far down as Santa Barbara County. We have won, uh, or this program has won national awards. We partner with the water pollution prevention agencies and retail businesses to bring integrated pest management education to you, the public. And we do this by um, providing information sheets on how to solve pest problems with an integrated pest management approach. You'll see these handouts at the Our Water World kiosk, which is this rack in um, many of the retailers are throughout the Bay Area. And so feel free to take these handouts, read them. They'll talk about uh, how to solve pest problems and maintain healthy gardens. You can also get these resources on the website. You'll also notice little tiny blue shelf tags. These shelf tags go underneath to uh, less toxic products to identify which ones are going to be eco-friendly that will not pose any harm to our waterways and, or our families, our pets, or the environment. So please check it out. It's got a lot of great information that um, helps you. So what is integrated pest management? Integrated pest management is uh, a science-based uh, strategy. It's a way we kind of look at our gardens as a whole uh, to identify what the problems are. And then we will um, apply science-based strategies to solve those problems. When we're looking at our gardens, and you know, this case, it could also be a home, but in this case is a garden. When we're looking at our gardens, we want to um, identify what the pest is. We want to understand the cause of that pest problem. And then we um, ask ourselves, is this something we can live with? Or is this a pest that's just going to be very minimal, short term, and it's going to kind of go away on its own? If we do need to take some action, then we use a combination of actions. And those actions are going to be cultural controls, bolstering the health of the environment, mechanical controls, the tools we use to manage pests and to prevent pests, biological controls, using living organisms to manage the pests, and then cultural controls. And these are the pesticides. We're always going to use them as a last resort and always the least toxic possible. And something to consider, if it's a plant that has never really uh, performed to your liking or has always struggled, uh, sometimes it doesn't matter how much fertilizer we feed it or how, you know, um, in some cases, if it's got a disease, maybe that plant's just prone to that disease, uh, any, uh, a number of applications of an eco fungicide might not correct it. So give yourself permission just to remove that plant, maybe give it to a friend. And then that gives you the invitation to plant something that's going to thrive that you're really going to like. So let's look at setting our gardens up for success. All right, thank you, Suzanne, for that intro. So uh, we're gonna start by looking at the cultural controls um, that we talked about and how um, to use the IPM techniques to just create a healthy garden. So we're gonna talk about compost, organic fertilizers, mulch, choosing the right plant for our gardens, proper watering and, and maintenance for the summertime and in general. So first compost, my favorite topic. Uh, compost is awesome and we should be adding it to our gardens and our soil um, regularly. Yeah, compost does some really wonderful things for our soil. It improves our soil structure. So again, I don't, in, if you are new to the, um, this webinar or to this series, um, I go more in depth in, in, it in a soil and compost webinar, but it improves your soil structure by really uh, gluing your sandy soil together and making it hold water better 
or if you have clay soil, it really opens up the clay soil, allowing roots and water to infiltrate. It's also wonderful for water retention, um, which is really important as we enter a period of drought. Uh, so compost can actually hold five times its weight in water. So it acts, it just turns the soil into a sponge. So we really wanna add, make sure we're adding that organic material um, via compost to our soil right now. It also inoculates the soil with good microbiology. Again, plants can't live without life in the soil. So it's really improve, adding that life, allowing our plants um, to be fed regularly by those soil organisms. And then compost also is amazing in that it filters pollutants from storm runoff. It can filter out 60 to 90% of uh, pollutants and it uh, stores it in the soil so it keeps our waterways clean. And then mulch is also amazing for many reasons. And when I'm talking about mulch, mulch is really anything covering the soil, anything we put over the soil. So it can be made of inorganic materials like uh, rubber or um, gravel, um, oyster shells, things like that. But when I'm talking about all of these benefits, I'm usually referring to um, organic mulch, kind of like wood chips, bark, straw, newspaper even could work as well. So mulch uh, can covers the soil, so it keeps the sun from reaching the soil and the weed seeds, so it keeps seeds from germinating and sprouting. It adds nutrients to soil and feeds soil organisms. Again, if we're using an organic mulch like wood chips or bark, as it breaks down, it's going to add nutrients to the soil and feed those uh, that life in the soil. It helps us save water um, because it adds that covering layer to your soil. So any moisture in the soil is not evaporating as quickly because your soil is covered and staying a little bit cooler. It also reduces soil compaction and erosion. So keeping the soil on place and keeping it full of um, air pockets and uh, allowing your, your plants roots to infiltrate. And then it acts like a little blanket, uh, keeping the soil cool in the summer and warm in the winter, which regu regulates the temperature for your roots, which um, is better for your plant roots as well. We always wanna make sure that we're keeping any mulch away from plant stems, uh, especially for trees and shrubs, um, any, because that can create moisture around the crown of the plant, which will invite uh, fungal diseases and rot. And then organic fertilizers, we wanna really switch to the, uh, or focus on the organic fertilizers as opposed to synthetic fertilizers. So um, any organic fertilizer usually says organic on the box. It might have an OMRI um, stamp on it. It might, not all of them do. Um, and it's, they're all, they're derived from organic materials like kelp, fish parts, um, compost, manure, uh, all natural materials as opposed to synthetic fertilizers, which are derived from fossil fuels and um, yeah, fossil fuel materials and things from the, that um, process. Uh, so organic fertilizers are wonderful because they come from natural materials. They break down slowly in the, in the soil, which is what we want. We're feeding the soil. We're not necessarily feeding our plant. So we want to feed those soil organisms that will then take all those nutrients and feed our plants when the plant wants it. As opposed to synthetic fertilizers are often compared to steroids for your plant. Um, they kind of inject your plant with a lot of nutrients really quickly and your plants often not ready for that or doesn't really want it. So it could cause stress on your plant, cause a lot of growth too quickly. Um, so we really wanna go for the slow release or the organics that are gonna give your plant what, you, what the plant wants when it wants it. And uh, organic fertilizers won't run off into local waterways because they will be broken down in the soil and just feeding the soil organisms over a long period of time. And then uh, earthworm castings are also a wonderful amendment for your garden. They're kind of somewhere between a compost and a fertilizer. Um, they are, it's a form of composting, um, vermicomposting. You can have worm bins in your backyard or you can buy the, the earthworm castings in a bag. 
Um, they are super, it's, and just to be clear, it's the earthworm poop <laughs> um, that we're talking about. Casting is just a fancy word for poop. Um, but the earthworms are amazing and that they, they process organic material and their waste is super nutrient rich and just full of enzymes, beneficial bacteria. The, um, the enzymes and the ba beneficial bacteria actually when added to soil can help inhibit uh, uh, diseases and um, insect pests. So really boost the health of the plant to be less attractive to pests and prevent itself uh, from getting diseases. Uh, really amazing stuff. Thank you, worms. And when we're choosing our plants that we're going to plant, we're going to remember right plant, right place. Remembering that we are in a very unique climate. The California uh, Bay Area specifically is a Mediterranean climate with our mild uh, but wetter winters and our dry hot summers. So we want to choose plants that can tolerate those um, that kind of climate. Mediterranean plants or California natives are adapted to that climate, so they're going to thrive. Whereas plants that maybe need a lot of frost or need a lot of water throughout the year might not do as well. Because again, as, if the plant is healthy and happy, it's going to be uh, less stressed out and less susceptible to pests. So we're going to choose, um, we're going to study our yard, see where the sun is, see where the shade is, see where the low points are, where things are moist, things are dry. And we're going to choose plants to go right uh, for our the right plants for our environment and the right plants for even the microclimates of our yard. And just a reminder to always look when you're at a nursery, these little plant tags in each plant has information about size, uh, sun, water needs, um, and all of those things are good to take into consideration when you're putting plants in your garden. Remembering plants do grow, hopefully, and so you don't wanna plant anything in a place where it's gonna get crowded that will also cause some stress. Um, and you can choose pest and disease resistant varieties um, that will also help you with, if you know there's, um, your area is prone to a specific pest or disease, choose a resistant variety. And then um, picking also, choosing a right plant in the right place will be more water efficient for you as well. And speaking of water efficiency, so planting your plants together that need the same water needs or have the same microclimate needs. So if they need full sun and lots of water. You're going to put all those plants together. It's not only going to make your plants happier because they're getting the appropriate amount of water, light, whatever they need. Um, you're, it's also going to make your life easier because you're only going to have to, you know, drag the hose over to the one section of plants that need a lot of water for example, <laughs> um, but it's gonna just make your life easier and it's gonna make the plants happier if they are all next to each other getting the right amount of um, water. And then um, another note on watering, we're gonna remember to water deeply but infrequently. So we really wanna make sure that we're consistently watering um, thoroughly we want to soak, we want to really soak the water, soak the soil, then we're going to let it dry out because we really want to encourage the roots, especially with new plants. New plants need a lot more water to get established. They need to, we want to encourage their roots to go down deep into the soil. So we're going to have that water go down deep into the soil. Um, and we're going to let it, but we're also going to let it dry out. The top, you know, one or two inches of the soil is going to drop back dry out between waterings so that we're not over watering and saturating and um, uh, causing our plants to get too much water and potentially invite um, mold diseases, fungal diseases like that. And that image on the right just demonstrates when you water deeply, your roots go nice and deep down. If you water frequently, but not a lot, those roots are just gonna stay at the surface where there's not a lot of moisture and there's a lot of evaporation. So you're gonna to need to water a lot um, and your plant's just not gonna thrive as well. And then we're gonna maintain a clean sanitary garden throughout the summer. So that means harvesting all of our foods food crops as soon as possible. 
um, so that we don't invite in yellow jackets, rats, other critters. Um, so any fallen fruit, nuts, any veggies, picking them as soon as possible. So fungal diseases can also um, find their way into those fallen um, fruits as well. So keeping any fungal, uh, fungus infected leaves and fruits, uh, picking those up and pruning them off immediately. And um, we're just gonna monitor frequently and always make sure we have a nice clean garden. All right. So now we're gonna talk about mechanical controls. And these are the tools that we use to manage pests and prevent pests. Tools could look like quarter inch hardware cloth, which is that galvanized wire fencing material. Uh, we could look at door sweeps to keep insects out of our home. Uh, fresh bead of caulk around windows or cracks and crevices will also keep pests out of our home. But out in the garden, we could look at maybe row cover to prevent insects from coming in to our vegetables. Uh, blasting uh, plants off with a strong stream of water does a great trick at removing a lot of insects, such as aphids, uh, white flies. Um, gosh, even question came up about sooty mold, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and uh, powdery mildew. Uh, also, you know, blasting it off with water. Uh, we will look at different types of weeding tools to employ around the garden, as well as uh, creating barriers. So a lot of uh, pest management has to in the garden has to do with creating barriers to prevent the insects from coming to where we, or whatever the pest is, coming to where we don't want it. Um, in this case, this is a sheet metal corner to prevent uh, rodents from coming into the garage. So when we work with barriers, as I mentioned, we will look at row covers, but bird netting, uh, bird scare tape, these are things to prevent the birds from eating our fruits and our berries. We could look at gopher baskets. If we have gophers on the property or if our neighbors do, every single plant is going to get planted in a gopher basket. Um, that extra uh, expense that might seem like, oh, I just didn't really want to spend that extra money on gopher baskets is going to be by far less expensive than you seeing your your beautiful prized plant getting um, completely sucked down into a gopher hole um, and um, chewed on by that gopher. Uh, of course, deer fencing. Deer fencing is how we you know, find ways to prevent deer from coming into our gardens, uh, working with the copper tape barrier to prevent slugs and snails from uh, getting to our little veggie starts. And then exclusion frames. Um, exclusion fencing, exclusion baskets. These are all going to be uh, a really important tool to utilize in the garden. Um, it seems that I've been noticing a lot on Instagram and other social media, Pinterest, in the garden, you're going to start to notice a lot of exclusion frames and baskets being featured because you are not the only person that is faced with squirrels and rats in your garden, or even rabbits and birds coming and eating the fruits and vegetables. So just wanted to share that this is a very normal thing. And if you wanna prevent any types of rodents or any critters coming in to eating your food crops or digging into the flower pots, then we wanna look at exclusion. And so for rats and mice, we're gonna look at quarter inch hardware cloth. Okay, because that's got a smaller hole. And uh, again, it's that wire meshing and we can um, prevent the rodents from coming in. Uh, gophers, we can work with half inch hardware cloth, lining raised beds or making our own baskets if we need to. Squirrels, it's going to be three quarter inch fencing or poultry wire or anything similar. And then deer fencing, it could be any size of, um, you know, a uh, gauge of uh, the fencing material. However, it has to be no less than seven feet tall. And I've been getting a lot of questions lately about cats. So how do we um, deter cats from, you know, scratching in our raised beds and our planter boxes in our gardens and using it as a litter box? Well, the number one way is to create a barrier and that's going to cover be covering the soil and or planting beds with um, these cat scat mats. 
which is a thing. I had seen them years ago at a client's and I knew you could only order them through one garden online or um, one garden um, catalog, but I did a web search yesterday and a lot of them came up. So um, you can put these around the plants or in the garden areas that you would like your cats or the neighbor's cats to not come and um, poop in. And if this, these can sit straight on top of the mulch or you can uh, place them and just do a very fine dusting of mulch on top. They really do want to be at the surface, but again, they're very discreet. So uh, they do an excellent job. You can also cover the areas with uh, things like bird netting. There are repellents, but understand the repellents are going to be temporary deterrents and not a guaranteed uh, solution. So what we want to work with are more of these tools that are going going to prevent the cats from coming into the area. That's what we want to think about when we're talking about tools, we, uh, barriers, exclusion. We want to prevent them from coming in. So working with traps, there's a lot of different types of traps on the market. We have rodent traps, like gopher traps, rat traps, and so forth. There are slug and snail boards. These are awesome. We make them out of fence boards with maybe one by twos underneath. We put these uh, uh, snail boards near where snails are eating our crops such as the chard or the daylilies or the lettuces and what happens is because slugs and snails do not like the sunshine once the sun comes up and the heat of the day is on they're going under this board for shade and shelter from that heat so midday we lift that up and we just scrape all those slugs and snails into a soapy bucket of water or feed it to the chickens Kind of gross. Um, a lot of sticky traps are on the market. Uh, oftentimes, um, you know, sticky traps such as coddling moth traps, uh, citrus leaf miner traps, um, diabrotica or cucumber beetle traps. Sometimes these have lures in them, a pheromone lure, but ultimately these traps are used as monitoring devices and not uh, necessarily as complete controls, but they're really helpful um, in helping us see smaller insects that we might not notice if, you know, uh, anyway. And then of course, yellow jacket traps and fly traps. These are all going to be really great tools for us to manage pests in the garden. And then uh, some of us, you know, back to the microclimates that Charlotte was speaking about, some of us have areas of our garden that uh, get really hot. They might be a real hot spot. And that might be the place that we just love growing our tomatoes. Um, keep in mind, it is important to always rotate our crops. However, in that hot spot, what we're noticing is that we are getting um, even hotter temperatures in the summer. And we can have a week of excessive heat. And in these cases, we might need to utilize the benefits of shade cloth. Shade cloth can prevent uh, our plants from getting sunburn. However, the way we want to utilize this shade cloth is having it tented over the raised bed or over the food crops. We do not want to lay tight like we would with row cover. We want to keep that air circulation. Um, the best types of shade cloth to use. If this is a uh, hot spot in the garden where you've got some um, evergreen plants that are prone to get sun scald, uh, a little bit of sunburn on their leaves, you can just get away with like a 10% uh, shade cloth. If this is a plant that's gonna be more sun sensitive, that's a year round plant in your garden, then you might wanna utilize a 30% shade cloth. And for food crops, such as our annual vegetables, uh, you might want to look at using anything from a 30 to 50% shade cloth. What we really want to understand is anything over 40 could sometimes be too much shade for our sun loving vegetables. Oftentimes they want the heat and they just want a little bit of shade from that super hot baking afternoon sun. Shade loving plants are going to prefer 75% uh, shade. And then just to keep it in perspective, us as people prefer an 80 to 90% shade. Um, if we have fruit trees or other trees that we've added to our garden, young trees will benefit from getting their trunks painted all the way up to where the trunks start to branch out. And the paint can be um, something, a product that you buy like Ivy Organics makes this awesome product that is a plant guard, or you can use a 50-50 latex paint to water 
anything that's a light color. So it could be white or pale green or pale yellow, whatever the color is, as long as it's pale and it's mixed 50-50 latex paint to water. All right, so we did cultural and mechanical controls. Now let's talk about the biological controls, which is um, using other organisms, organisms to take care of our pests for us. Um, a lot of times this is in the form of beneficial insects. So we're gonna focus on our pollinators, our predators and our parasitic insects, the three Ps. So pollinators, which should be bees and butterflies that are gonna pollinate our fruit um, to give us nice tomatoes and other fruits. Uh, our predators, which could be spiders, lady beetles, um, and, and lace wings. So they eat a lot of insect pests like aphids, thrips, and scale. And then our parasitic insects, like little tiny parasitic, parasitic wasps, which lay eggs on um, some caterpillars and those eggs will hatch and eat the caterpillar from the inside, <laughs> kind of gross, but hey, we don't have to deal with the caterpillar, so it helps us. Um, we want to remember that 90% of the bugs in the garden are actually good bugs. So again, we'll talk about identification later, but, but this is going to be, it's really important to remember when we are seeing um, insects in the garden, we don't immediately want to jump to a spray or uh, under, uh, think that they're killing our plant because they could be um, a good bug and we want to nurture them if they are. And also remembering that good bugs, it's okay. <laughs> uh, it's also remembering that uh, bad bugs or pests tend to be seasonal, uh, whereas good bugs are usually, um, can often be almost year round. So um, we wanna focus on nurturing them throughout the year as well. Now you can go to the next slide. Awesome. And so to um, attract those good bugs, we're gonna focus on growing diversity. So lots of different plants will attract lots of different bugs and including lots of good bugs. And then there's a lot of plants that they specific, specific bugs like, uh, ladybugs, for example, like yarrow, which is the pink flower um, below. They like uh, tansy, clover, daisy-like flowers. So really any kind of, uh, a lot of beneficial insects like flowers with clumps of tiny flowers like that yarrow or ceanothus. Um, or daisy-like flowers, so even sunflowers or um, daisies, that anything with that little button in the middle and the ray of petals around it. Um, and understanding that also it's not just beneficial insects that we're focusing on, we're really, the biological controls is really thinking about our garden as an ecosystem. So understanding that all critters do have a place in this ecosystem and a lot of critters maybe we don't necessarily want, uh, snakes and coyotes in our yard, but uh, understanding that every uh, every critter in the world really is just creating balance. And we do have pest infestations. That means that there's um, a lack of balance. So we really want to invite in those good uh, insects, birds, other critters that can help keep that balance in. And we're also going to remember with um, especially insects and birds, but all critters, we want to really avoid any toxic chemicals in our garden because that's going to hurt them as well. Okay, now we're going to talk about the chemical controls. So as I mentioned before, we're always going to go for the least toxic. And the beautiful thing is, is that nowadays science is so advanced that just about every single pesticide manufacturer is manufacturing eco-friendly pesticides. Um, so they're readily available and uh, they come with a number of different types of active ingredients, such as insecticidal soap, there's different types of oils, um, neem, horticultural oils, uh, organicide, which is sesame oil. Uh, there's biopesticides that are fermented bacteria or beneficial bacteria that are ingested by the insects, either in granular form or when we spray on the plant. Um, so just understand there's a very wide uh, selection of, um, of eco-friendly pesticides now, but they all have a slightly different mode of action. Some need to be ingested for it to kill that insect. Others need to coat that insect to kill it. And when we choose 
pesticides, we're always going to use them as a last resort. Oftentimes, we have already um, you know, employed all of these other tools and techniques, which are drastically reducing the pest problems in the garden. So there are times that we might have to use a pesticide. So we're always then going to use the least toxic and most you know, eco-friendly. We're going to always apply that pesticide according to the label. We're always going to wear protective clothing and different types of protective equipment. Understand that all of the pesticides the eco-friendly pesticides are still pesticides designed to kill something. And we are not familiar if we're going to have a dermal reaction. I heard uh, other professional friends say that they've had a dermal reaction from insecticidal soap or neem. So please, by all means, wear long sleeves, non-cotton gloves, pants, shoes, mask, and goggles. We do not spray when there is a breeze more than five miles an hour because we don't want that pesticide to spray on back onto us or on any untargeted un plant. Um, we just want to, I just want to remind you, it's just not a good idea to be out there in your short shorts and flip-flops spraying, which I see a lot. Um, and then of course, we want to understand the risks of doing the pesticides. So it's always a good idea to uh, have a very good understanding of how that active ingredient works and, um, and what to expect uh, when we've applied that product. So sometimes eco-friendlies could take a little longer to work. So for instance, in the case of neem, neem is very popular, but it could take about four days before we see insect, pest insect populations decline. Uh, we also wanna understand that timing is really important. We wanna understand the pest life cycle and, um, and then apply the pesticide when that pest is present. Uh, we want to spot treat. It is not necessary to spray down the entire garden. We want to make sure we're just targeting that pest. We, the best time to apply pesticide is at sundown, very late in the day. Um, a number of reasons, this is the cooler time of the day. Typically those afternoon breezes have also uh, disappeared. And our pollinators, our beneficial insects uh, are typically not as active. They're typically back in their hives or their nests. However, have a closer look because I still see a lot of bumblebees out well after sundown. Um, so I just wanna make sure that if I'm needing to apply a pesticide that there are no beneficial insects present. And then if we are going to release uh, beneficial insects, please give them a little time to take care of those uh, pests before we go for a pesticide. Something to keep in mind, if we are applying or we want to uh, release beneficial insects, there has to be food in the garden or they're going to fly away. They're going to go on the hunt looking for food. If we want to attract beneficial insects, we need to have food for them. So having a tolerance of having some aphids or having a plant that's completely covered with aphids, it's going to be okay because guess what? Those beneficial insects are gonna find it. And then when we use a pesticide, we really wanna understand the unintended consequences of these pesticides. So what happens when we have pesticides lying around the house that we no longer want? We're gonna take them to our local household hazardous waste facility. It is free and it's easy. And something to keep in mind, even Windex is considered household hazardous waste. So just invite you to take a tour of your local household hazardous waste facility. It's so much fun. You just pull up, they take the products out of your car and then you drive away. It's the best. All right, so now we're gonna, we kind of covered the basics of IPM. So now we're gonna look more specifically at some specific pests and how to tackle those problems. And step one in all IPM, of all IPM is identification. So we really wanna know what we're targeting. And this is um, important for a few reasons. We wanna um, understand the life cycle of the pest. So again, it, understanding the life cycle is we'll know how long they're gonna live. So maybe they're short-lived like us, what is a spittle bug? <laughs> it's only one or two weeks long. And you know that in two weeks they're gonna go away so we can just let them go. Also certain at certain points of the life cycle is better to uh, use different actions on that pest as well. So we're gonna understand also when, where the pest likes to live and when it likes to come out. 
Aphids are very common right now because it's spring, it's warm. Uh, that's when they do come out. So we understand that. And then also understanding the natural enemies of this pest. If we know that there are some natural enemies in the garden, we're gonna make sure we're nurturing them and allowing them to do their job for us. So aphids is our, gonna be our first uh, pest today. I'm sure a lot of people are dealing with aphids um, because again, it's spring, well, it's almost summer now, it's spring, it's warm, the, and then the plants are starting to shoot out new growth. Aphids like that new growth. So um, understanding that it's really normal to have aphids, even if you're doing everything right, it's fairly normal to have aphids during this time. But there are some things that we can do to lessen their populations uh, if they do arrive. So, or when they arrive. So we're gonna avoid synthetic fertilizers because again, synthetic fertilizers act like steroids for your plants and will cause your plant to grow even faster um, and stress out your plant, which again, that new growth is very attractive. Stressed plants are also very attractive to aphids and other pests as well. So switching to an organic fertilizer will slow that growth, but will create a healthier plant. Excessive pruning can also lead to more growth. Uh, pruning does promote growth, so too much pruning can cause too much new growth and again attracting aphids and other pests. We're going to, um, if we do see aphids and we also see a lot of ants, ants like to protect um, Ants like to protect aphids because they like to farm that, that honeydew secretion that they leave behind, the kind of sticky uh, material that you'll see on the leaves. Ants like to um, farm that and eat that. So they're gonna actually protect aphids from natural enemies, uh, natural predators like ladybugs. So uh, if you do see ants doing that, we're gonna make sure we're preventing the ants um, or, or uh, you know, keeping the ant populations down, either using bait stations or some insect sticky glue on the trunk of the uh, plant. And then lack of predators could also um, help the aphids. So again, we wanna be inviting in all those um, beneficial insects with nectar and uh, ne or nectar filled plants and um, less pesticides. So some more actions for aphids. Uh, I'm gonna just jump down the list. First action should be, well, actually I take that back. <laughs> Let me start that one over. Organic fertilizer is the first thing we should be doing. Switching from synthetic to organic fertilizers. Again, uh, as we're growing the plant, healthier, slower growth, but healthier, hardier growth as well. Less uh, or healthy pruning. So not over pruning, being aware of what the plant needs. Um, and then inviting in the beneficial insects, providing habitat for ladybugs and other um, insects as well. If you do see aphids on the plant, the simplest thing to do at first is to just hose the plant off with water. It's gonna knock off a lot of um, aphids very quickly. Aphids are sucking insects, so their mouth parts are like little straws and their straw, their mouth parts are like injected into the plant. And so when you hose them off with water, their body goes one way, but their mouth parts stay on the plant and it kills them. So it's not gonna get all of them, but it is going to knock back the population a lot. You can also just wipe off the plant as well if you don't wanna blast it with water. And then lastly, you can uh, try an insecticidal soap or a horticultural oil is an option for aphids as well. All right. So I'm going to talk about white flies, which seem to be very common once the temperatures get even a little warmer. So white flies are um, little tiny white flies that when we knock the plant or the leaves of the plant, they fly away. And if we look under the plant, typically we see these little tiny, um, almost like cottony little nubs. Those are the nymphs and the nymphs are actually feeding off the juices of the leaf. Um, what we are actually going to target is trying to reduce those nymphs. Uh, one thing I can share is that this is not always the case. Some plants are just prone to getting white flies. However, oftentimes white flies can be an indication of overwatering or poor drainage. So if you notice a white fly infestation on your plants, the first thing you want to uh, look into is um, 
looking at correcting the water. Is that plant draining? Is the pot draining well? Is the soil able to dry out? Something else is very common is come July, August, a lot of tomatoes or summer squash. I'll hear folks say that they have uh, white flies on their tomatoes and their summer squash. A couple things to keep in mind. Are we still watering them as we did the day we planted it when the root systems were only like this big? Because by July um, and August, those root systems are very deep, up to six feet in some cases, and just as wide. So we want to make sure we're adjusting that irrigation, bringing it out, watering the drip zone, the root zone of that plant, making sure we're watering deeply, and we're letting the soil dry out a few inches before we water again. Remember, as our vegetables grow, they're also casting shade on that soil, reducing water evaporation, even if we have mulch there. Um, synthetic fertilizers are going to uh, attract uh, the white flies in a similar way that they attract the aphids. And then of course, lack of predators just in the same fashion as the aphids. So here are some solutions. We wanna check the irrigation schedule. We wanna make sure these irrigation schedules or the irrigation clocks are not set it and forget it. We are changing them and adjusting them as we get longer daylight hours, as we get shorter daylight hours, as our plants are growing and so forth. Uh, we want to um, change the plant, maybe choose a different, uh, uh, type of plant. You know, some plants, as I mentioned, are prone to them. I know begonias specifically are prone to getting white flies. Um, so maybe just, you know, switch it out with another uh, type of plant that isn't going to be as prone, plants that are going to be more resilient. Uh, also, pruning, increasing the airflow is really going to help. We want to wash the leaves off. We want to use eco friendly products like insecticidal soaps and oils. And with the white flies, because they fly away, uh, it's really challenging to actually coat them with the, in, the pesticides. So it's really good time to also utilize the yellow sticky traps. So this is one of the only times, well, not really. It's just one of the times where you actually have to use two methods that if you are using a pesticide, you also wanna use the sticky traps. Something else I can share is because that question that came up straight away about sooty mold. Uh, white flies, white fly nymphs, aphids, scale insects, thrips. A lot of these insects also secrete a sugary substance that we refer to in the industry as honeydew. As Charlotte just mentioned, the ants farm that honeydew. It's really sweet and um, delicious for them. Uh, green lacewings actually also feed off of it. But when we have an excess of this honeydew on the leaves, because it drops down, it coats leaves below, uh, it is um, live organic matter. So it's going to mold and then it's going to turn kind of a black. And because it's so fine, so thin, and it's just a very thin coating on the leaf, oftentimes it's mistaken as a fungus, but this is sooty mold. So if we have sooty mold, uh, it, which is very common, it is an indicator that we have a pest such as white flies or aphids or scale insects. So take a closer look and see what that pest is. You're going to want to manage that pest, adjust the environment, correct it, make sure the plant is in its healthiest environment, and uh, remove those leaves and go from there. Veggie leaf miner is very common as soon as the temperatures start to warm. In fact, uh, it's already hitting my chard. Veggie leaf miner can hit chard, beets, and spinach. Uh, it is a small fly that lays eggs on the underneath of the leaf. So you can flip the leaves over and inspect. You'll see these little, they look like little tiny grains of rice. Um, the uh, eggs hatch the larva, then will burrow between the two layers of the leaf. So it's fairly protected. And then it makes this kind of translucent, almost um, transparent uh, glass-like uh, um, illusion where the leaves are now just kind of two very thin papery um, top and bottom because that larva has eaten all of the sugary juices within that leaf. I will also share that when in the fall or when the temperatures start to cool, that larva is going to drop into the soil and overwinter there. So how do we manage 
the um, veggie leaf miner? Well, I personally only plant the spinach, beets, and chard during the cool months. So I start my seedlings in, or I start buying the plants in the fall, and I only grow throughout the cold months of the winter and into early spring because I just don't have any tolerance for veggie leaf miner. However, when we start to see it, we can, um, remove those leaves, squish that larva that's between the leaves that might sound really gross, or we take those leaves and we put them in a paper bag and put it into the green can. We wanna make sure that paper bag is rolled up and kind of sealed. And we're gonna put it in that green waistband, the uh, green waste can. The reason why we wanna put it in a sealed paper bag is because in a couple of days, that larva is going to emerge as the adult fly picture is shown on the left. The fly is very, very tiny. Um, it's about a quarter of an inch, so very small. And uh, and the next time we open up the lid to that green waistband, that fly is gonna come out and continue the life cycle. So that's why it's so important to, um, if we're not gonna squish the larva in the leaf, which is kind of gross, we wanna seal it up in a uh, paper bag and get it off site. We can inoculate the soil with beneficial nematodes because they're going to feed off of the larva. And we're also going to use blue sticky traps, hang it around the plants that are prone to get uh, the vegetable leaf miner because this is going to be our indicator. It's going to help us identify when that adult fly is active. Because it's so tiny, it's very hard to identify or notice it when we're just working in our gardens. Citrus leaf miner is a different insect. It's going to do a very similar type of damage to the citrus leaves. However, in this case, it's a very, very tiny moth. She's very pretty, she's pale and very fluffy looking. Um, however, um, again, hard to identify because she's so small. And what she's doing is in a similar fashion, laying eggs underneath that leaf and those eggs are going to hatch. And then we're going to see the larva uh, mining its way through those sugary juices of the leaf. Again, protected because it's between the two layers of the leaf. So um, some things that attract them is when we are feeding our plants with high nitrogen and synthetic fertilizers. We are uh, stimulating a lot of new growth. And these insects are not ding-dongs. They know that new growth is exactly what their young can um, pierce through the cell wall to get to those sugary juices. That's why we pretty much only see insect damage on tender new growth. Now, this is not um, hundred percent across the board, but this is like a general rule of thumb. We're always going to notice these pests when there's a lot of new growth on the plant. Um, typically the leaf miner is not going to cause harm to the overall health of the plant. And of course is not causing any harm to the fruit. However, uh, it is, you know, when it starts to become more than like 20% of the plant, you want to take some action. Different types of actions that uh, can help minimize the citrus leaf miner is by inviting in beneficial insects, by planting a variety of those insectary plants, plants that have nectar and that are very tiny for our tiny, in this case, uh, parasitic wasps. These wasps are going to come and actually lay their eggs either on the eggs or the larva of that um, of the miner. And yes, it can pierce through the cell of the leaf to um, eject an egg into that mining part of the citrus miner. We are going to feed our citrus with organic fertilizers. Also understand that citrus are heavy feeders. They require a lot of food because they're evergreen and it takes a lot of food for them to produce the citrus. So you could be stressing your plants out by not feeding regularly enough. Um, that's just something to keep in mind. We're going to always want to follow the feeding instructions that are on the bag or the box of the citrus organic fertilizer. Uh, we want to uh, prune selectively. And what I mean prune selectively is pruning at the very end of fall when we're about six weeks before the first frost, or we can prune late winter, early spring after the last frost, or very soon around the last frost, and we would just protect that plant then with a frost blanket, some type of a um, frost protection material. 
because what's happening is that new growth is going to be stimulated and it could be prone to frost damage. So we want to protect it. But before this time, you know, what is this? Uh, the first of May, but like mid April, we want to have that new growth already uh, hardened off to prevent any future citrus leaf miners from coming in and laying their eggs. Uh, products that we can use would be things like Spinosad. Uh, brand names of Spinosad would be Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. Uh, if we are using this, keep in mind, the label says we only get to use it six times a year to prevent pesticide resistance. So follow that label. If you're using Spinosad, only spray it six times a year. Uh, Monterey's uh, also makes a, a spinosad product, which is called Garden Insect Spray. Um, there's other products like horticultural oil and neem, and they're actually going to, we're going to target the eggs to uh, prevent them from hatching and burrowing into the leaf. That was kind of a lot. All right, and so some of you who grow brassicas or coal crops, <clears throat> like cabbage, kale, broccoli, things like that might notice that your leaves have gone eaten a lot. That's likely due to the white cabbage moth larva. So you'll see sometimes a white uh, moth with a little black dot on it flying around um, your coal crops. Uh, what happens is they land on the leaves, they, um, they lay in eggs on the leaves and then the, the usually the underside of the leaves the eggs hatch, a little green caterpillar comes out and munches away on those leaves. Very frustrating. I have lots of experience with them. I'm very, <laughs> I'm very <laughs> frustrated by them. But there are some things that are pretty easy that you can do to um, avoid too much damage from them. So um, adults are inactive during cold months. So it, we're fortunate in the Bay Area that you, we can grow in the uh, cooler winter months. So that might be a good option for you if you don't get uh, too much uh, frost in your area. Um, you can protect your plants with row cover. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and you can just carefully inspect uh, your plants. I think this is the uh, best thing to do. So your coal crops, again, very carefully inspecting them. Um, both sides of the leaves, especially the underside of the leaf, we're going to really um, be very adamant and diligent about um, checking if we, especially if we do see that moth flying around. Uh, the eggs are teeny tiny little like rice things that kind of stick out from the leaf, like the, it's the middle picture, that's the, the larva or the eggs, excuse me. And then out hatch these green caterpillar, the photo on the bottom is what I'm talking about. Uh, they start very small, but then they can get nice, fat and juicy if, if they have lots of food. Um, so keeping an eye out for both of those. I recommend if you're okay with it, uh, smashing the eggs, just smushing them as soon as you see them or just brushing them off, wiping them off with a cloth, whatever you feel comfortable with. That's gonna um, definitely reduce a lot of um, caterpillar damage. And then when you do, see caterpillars again they are like they blend into the leaves so really careful inspection um super super careful um you can just remove them either drop them in some soapy water smash them feed them to your chickens whatever you feel comfortable with and then we can go to the next slide to see we can use row cover though i would definitely recommend if you do use row cover it's super helpful it'll protect your plants from the, the moth landing on your plants. But before you set up the row cover, make sure you're doing a thorough, thorough inspection of those leaves, because if there are eggs or larvae already on your plants, you've just created a nice little warm greenhouse for them to flourish in. So um, inspect your leaves before you attach the, put on the row cover, and then every, every time still worth an inspection as well. You can also use a a product called BT, which is a bacteria that targets um, caterpillars only. So it's super narrow spectrum. So therefore it's pretty eco-friendly. It only tar targets caterpillars. Um, and you can spray this when the pest is present. What happens, it needs to be on the leaf. You can spray the leaf and the plant parts and the uh, caterpillar will ingest it, needs to eat it and that it will kill them that way. Uh, making sure that you are, again, this is where in identification comes in handy, that you are actually targeting 
this larva, the cabbage moth larva, as opposed to um, perhaps a, another but, a butterfly larva or a larva of um, some sort of moth or butterfly that you don't want to kill. Um, caterpillars tend to be very host specific. So you see a green caterpillar on kale, it's highly likely that it's a, a cabbage moth. So wouldn't too, worry too much about it, but definitely um, be sure before you spray. And then this is just, this is an example of knocking off pests into a bucket of soapy water. This is not, um, a, this is a cucumber beetle, it's not a cabbage moth larva, but uh, works for a lot of plants, aphids, um, yeah, <laughs> caterpillars, all snails, all, all easy to drop into a soapy bucket of water to deal with. All right, and then rust. We're going to talk about some a couple of fungal diseases. So rust, very common on roses and lots of different plants. Those hollyhock, uh, even grasses sometimes get rust. Um, so ways to, to uh, rust is very similar to lots of other fungal diseases. It likes cooler temperatures, darkness, and moisture. So we're going to remove any sign, any leaves at the first sign of rust. Um, and again, it's called rust because it is orangey, reddish, yellowy, it looks, or brownish, it looks like there is just, you know, rust on your plant. Um, uh, we're going to avoid overhead watering. This is where drip irrigation really comes in handy with your plant. So uh, we don't want to get those leaves wet. Um, and we're going to prune. Uh, selective pruning means we're pruning to allow for airflow and light to infiltrate the plant because again, they like darkness and moisture. So more air, more light, uh, less fungus. And then very similarly, there's black spot, also very common on roses. Um, and similar, uh, uh, it likes cooler moisture. Um, and so we're gonna remove the leaves at the first sign. We're gonna avoid overhead watering and we're gonna prune for airflow. Neither rust nor black spot are super deadly to plants. It's very often just an aesthetic issue. Uh, it just makes the plant not look as nice. Um, but in most cases, I say most cases, not all cases, uh, the plant might, you know, lose some leaves, slow growth a little bit. But overall, if you do, um, if you are attentive to your plant and you're treating your plant well with fertilizer and compost and proper watering, it's going to be able to withstand um, any uh, of these two fungal diseases. And then some other ways to tackle these diseases though, because we don't want to let it go completely untreated. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna, there are many plants that are prone to these diseases. So if you do have certain plants like roses, hollyhocks, um, uh, even I think, um, Sunflowers, iris, lily, also very prone to rust. Um, so you can expect that from certain plants. Uh, we can choose resistant plant varieties. They do make plants that are more resistant to those diseases. We're gonna always remove the foliage um, as soon as possible um, and put it in our green bin, never in our compost. We're gonna, again, really focus on the health of the plant because a healthy plant can withstand some fungal diseases and fight it off. Um, so good airflow, proper watering and fertilizing. We're gonna avoid overhead watering, either with um, uh, hand watering or using drip irrigation. And then, um, uh, oh, and also we're gonna water earlier in the day so that it's not, moist later when the, the temperatures get cooler. And then if you do want to try an eco-fungicide, um, there are several options, different ingredients um, for the eco-fungicides, sulfur, copper soap, neem oil, um, organocide, which is sesame oil, or um, certain strains of bacteria. I apologize, I cannot pronounce that one, but um, that bacteria can help with fungal diseases. And also with many fungal diseases, it's really important to, if you do have a plant that is always has a disease um, in the spring, you might wanna consider dormant spraying. So this is spraying your plant in the dormant season after all the leaves have dropped. So this is for deciduous plants only, 
all of the leaves have dropped. We're spraying just the, the branches of the tree with a copper fungicide that will um, hopefully take care of the fungal uh, spores and disease um, while it's overwintering and lead to less uh, uh, disease in the spring. And then we have one more fungal disease. This is set us apart from the other two because it's actually powdery mildew is um, a little bit different than most other fungal diseases. So um, powdery mildew, it looks like there's a white or gray film on your leaves, usually leaves and branches. Sometimes fruit and buds can get it as well. But powdery mildew actually likes dry conditions and it likes warmer conditions. So 60 to 80 degrees is pretty optimal and dryness, which is definitely sets it apart from the other fungal diseases. So things we can do uh, for powdery mildew, um, like the other diseases, we're gonna provide good airflow, proper watering, proper fertilizing, but because powdery mildew likes dry, we're actually gonna use the watering to help us um, Fight, fight it a little bit. So we can either wash the plant leaves off with um, you know, either syringing like very careful watering of the leaves or wiping it off with a wet towel. We can do over, uh, overhead watering for powdery mildew, but we do wanna make sure that we're doing it um, in mid morning or earlier in the morning so that the plant has time over the rest of the day to dry and then so that in the evening when the temperature is cooled down, it's a dry plant and it won't invite those other diseases that do like the cooler wet temperatures. Uh, again, we're gonna remove any infected leaves as soon as possible, put them in our green bin, not our compost pile, um, and clean up any material at the end of the season so that we're not um, having overwintering spores in our garden as well. There are also resistant plant varieties and they're also like those other like rust and black spot. There are also a lot of plants that are prone to powdery mildew. And a lot of times, um, again, they don't totally damage the plant. So for example, like pumpkin and squashes get powdery mildew a lot um, often, almost guaranteed on their leaves, but it's not going to inhibit the fruit growth as long as the plant is being well taken care of. So, um, and then if you do wanna try eco-fungicides, also sulfur, co copper soap, neem oil, organocide, and dormant spraying also can help with powdery mildew. Okay, so we're just going to finish up with a couple more pests. Uh, we're gonna talk about managing weeds. The takeaway with man managing weeds is to make sure that you've taken care of them before they go to flower. Um, there's a lot of different types of weeds. Some are annuals, some are perennials. Um, some actually, uh, many will reproduce by the seeds. Uh, some will um, reproduce by um, uh, spreading through the root systems. However, it, the takeaway is just please, please, please prevent your weeds from going to seed. That is going to help you significantly. And we can um, do this by hand pulling the weeds before they go to seed. We're gonna take care of them when they're little. We're gonna use uh, weeding hose and cultivators, dandelion weeders, any type of gardening knives like hori horis, trowels, shovels, sheet mulch. Take advantage of all the benefits of sheet mulch. If we've got an area of the garden that's just crummy and it's got like, you know, tons of weeds or we did let it go to seed and the weeds are already like shin high, just step those weeds down, put different layers, multiple layers of cardboard overlapping and a nice thick layer of mulch, no less than three inches. That is going to take care of those weeds. It is amazing. We also want to take advantage of line trimmers and mowers. I mean, it could just be as easy as mowing the, the lawn. We're mowing the weeds, preventing them from go to seed, and we still have this green mat that we can still kind of call a lawn. But that's really the takeaway. I mean, there's more to it, but the in a in the cliff notes is just prevent them from going to seed. Rodents in the garden are growing. It's uh, pretty much a, the number one pest problem. I think Charlotte and I talk about every day. Uh, so. I, there's a couple of things I want to share. We want to remove their places of harborage. So if we've got that bank of ground cover, 
um, specifically IV, we want to make sure we remove it. It can be very costly to remove it, but it's going to also prevent the rodents. Uh, we've got those um, piles of bricks or flagstone from a patio project that we finished or never got to. We want to disassemble those. We want to contain um, our compost and chicken coops, again, with that quarter inch hardware cloth. We want to keep lids on garbage cans. We want to remove pet food availability. We want to rethink bird feeders because when the seed falls, it's attracting rodents. We want to remove their food source. When they do not have a food source, they are not going to be in our gardens. And we do this by um, creating barriers and exclusion frames. This picture from Homestead Design Collective, okay? These are trending. Everybody has rodents in their garden. So we are starting to see these gorgeous photos of these really cool different types of exclusion frames and cages that are preventing rodents, squirrels, birds and such from getting to our food. Now, pollinators can still make it through. Um, and so keep that in mind. Gophers, gophers are going to be different than moles. Gophers are eating the roots. Moles are eating the grubs and other soil dwelling insects. Moles are somewhat beneficial because they're taking care of the larva form of a lot of pests. Gophers are by no means beneficial. They are eating my plants and they are just no good. So I'm going to make sure I plant everything in a gopher basket or I'm going to line my raised beds with half inch hardware cloth. Now we can use traps. Um, we, when we're using gopher traps, we want to be very persistent. Um, they are a little challenging because they're really smart. But with persistence and patience, we can actually um, do a very good job at keeping the populations down. And if we're really not into dealing with the traps, working with repellents, things with, that have the active ingredient castor oil are going to, uh, we see that they do uh, work well. They do prevent uh, the critters from um, dwelling from coming into these areas. However, again, these are temporary deterrents. Repellents are gonna be temporary deterrents and you will need to uh, apply them according to the label's directions. In the case of the Molmax, it needs to get applied a few times before there's enough of that repellent in the soil to actually prevent them from entering those areas. All right, so that was a lot for you all. I hope that was helpful, but we really just wanna, uh, just focus on, again, the cultural controls are really the, the foundation um, and really can be a prevention to any pest problems. So really focusing on the, healthy, the health of your garden, the health of your plants, the health of your soil will all lead to pest, less pest problems. So it's going to prevent pests from coming in. We're going to build our soil health. Our, healthy soil with compost, organic fertilizers, and mulch. We're going to choose the right plants for our yard and the right parts of our yard. We're going to water properly, which would be deeply and infrequently, and uh, well again, and watering frequently for new plants as well to help them get established. We're going to invite in the beneficials and the pollinators by planting diversity and avoiding pesticides. And we're going to always be monitoring for pests and properly identifying them if they do arrive, um, because then we that will allow us to address the root cause of how they got in, why they're there, um, and how we can treat them uh, most effectively but less toxic. And some resources for you, the Our Water, Our World website, it's actually going to get a facelift very shortly. So in a few weeks, you might see it look a little different than what it looks like on this screen. Um, it has all of our fact sheets on it um, in PDF form and also the store locations of the stores that partner with Our Water, Our World. And then the UCIPM website is super, super helpful. I use it frequently, um, has tons of information about pretty much any pest um, in California uh, for pretty much any plant as well. And it has this really great, um, I call it like a symptom tracker, kind of like on WebMD, where if you don't really know what you're looking at, it's a great way to identify some options. So you can type in what kind of damage you see, what on what part of the plant, what plant it is, and that will help you narrow down what the pest could possibly be. 
And with that, um, we will switch to answering your questions, but I want to thank Jen and Slope Gardens for having us. And you are, anyone is also welcome to email either of us anytime or uh, visit our uh, Instagram <laughs> handles as well. And um, we'll hopefully answer most of your questions here as well. Yeah, thanks for joining. I know it was a lot of content and we definitely went over the uh, 45 minutes an hour that I had estimated, but we wanted to make sure you got uh, felt support and we're able to really get you some solutions for a lot of the common pest problems. So thanks for sticking around. Yeah, thank you both. That was a really uh, valuable presentation of information. And um, what I like about your presentations is that I feel like they're really accessible to beginner gardeners as well as advanced gardeners. Like myself, I personally learned that beneficial insects are year round and pest insects are seasonal. And I never knew that before. Um, so that's really fun. I do want to acknowledge, I didn't point this out at the beginning because on the poll we did have uh, what do you consider yourself? What yeah. level of gardener? And 40% are beginners and they're excited to learn. And we're so excited for you. Uh, and we're here to support you in your gardening journey. And so like Suzanne and Charlotte said, they are available for your questions. Also my email, Jen Strobel uh, at slopegardens.com. I think that's all over every email you get about the webinars. Um, feel free to email me too. And a reminder that the recording of this should be available on Tuesday, May 4th. And that's really good to uh, a good resource to be able to sort of rewind and pause and fast forward and screenshot and whatnot um, for, uh, to go back over the information of the presentation. Um, I also want to share that I, you know, especially for the beginner gardeners, one thing that I, another takeaway that I've gotten from Suzanne and Charlotte's presentation really is to, it's so important to keep in mind that it's really just the, the entire environment as a whole that really works together to make your garden more successful. And also that 70% of the garden is the stuff you don't see. It's the soil, the fertilizer and the irrigation. Um, I just went to a client yesterday and they were so excited. They had planted this whole row of star jasmine and it was looking stressed and suffering. And my first question was, did you plant with good compost and transplant food? And they hadn't. And so just, you know, thinking, thinking about that, those are those steps as you're going through your garden process is super critical for the overall health of your garden. Okay. So thank you again. And um, a couple questions that came through. One was about ants. Um, when, you, when you see a bunch of ants in the garden, whether it's in your soil or crawling up your plants, what do you do for that? Okay, well, when there's ants in the soil, I'll start and then you can finish, Charlotte. That's typically, uh, it's going to tell me that the soil is dry. So I, it might be an area that maybe it's a pot, a flower pot that I'm not watering that often, or maybe it's a raised bed that I haven't, you know, cultivated for a while. So it's really just starting to work that soil and, you know, making it a little bit more active. That's going to reduce the ants in the soil. Right. Thank you. I just learned that too. I did not know that because <laughs> I was going to just say that generally ants in the soil, they can be a nuisance and not like super fun to work with, but ants are decomposers. Mm -hmm. So they're actually working to eat the organic material in the soil, which is what we want. Um, and they're also aerating the soil, which is also we want air um, to in be able to infiltrate the soil. So I know there can be annoying, especially, and I don't know really what to do if they're like biting you, that's a whole other issue. But generally, if they're not bothering you, they just let them decompose that soil. Um, it's really when they're fighting off or protecting pests from beneficial insects um, and not allowing beneficial insects to do their job is when we need to control them in the garden. 
isn't um, can't they also be an indicator of a pest because they you know they feed off of excrement of like mm -hmm. scale and stuff so yeah so if we see them it's very common to see them trailing up a butylons or like fruit trees um, even, you know, roses and other shrubs, that's going to tell me that I've got another pest such as an aphid, scale, uh, white fly nymphs, white flies, thrips, um, really anything that is secreting those uh, sticky, sugary honeydew uh, juices that they're feeding on and farming. So yeah, that's an indicator. And then we would tackle that pest. And just a basic question, do aphids come in, a, in different colors or are they just brown or black? Yeah, we have oddly or surprisingly over 400 different species of aphids throughout the Bay Area. There's many aphids and they all have their very special names. Like the black bean aphid right now is completely covering my fava beans, um, which looks really gross, but it's also inviting in more beneficial insects and species of beneficials than I've ever seen before. So um, typically the aphids are very host specific, not always, uh, but we can um, typically understand that I know that those black bean aphids are not gonna get over on my rose. In fact, right now my roses are starting to show those little kind of limey tan aphids. Um, so I have a huge tolerance for aphids because I know they're not going to, they're, they're rather host specific, but I also know if I don't have food for beneficials, the beneficials are not going to come. So I kind of let like plants kind of be um, sacrificial. And when they're at the end of their life cycle and they're loaded up with um, a pest like aphids, I kind of let it hang out for a little bit so I can bring in more of those good bugs. Yeah. And also remember that aphids shed skin. So if you, so another thing you might notice on your plants is there's a bunch of like yeah. whitish or off white flecks of stuff, like a ton of it. And that's not actually the bug that is the skin of the bug. Um, so you might not have the bug anymore. You might just have the skin of the bug, you know, just look and see the level you need to deal with right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And with that said, um, I see that there's a question about excessive pruning with roses. Yes, roses and fruit trees really require to get pruned fairly hard, as well as other plants. This is not going to necessarily trigger um, uh, aphid infestations or other pest infestations. What we are trying to articulate um, and we apologize that I didn't get across, is pest insects typically like the new growth of plants. So that's why we see so many pests in the spring, because in the spring we have a lot of new growth flushing out. Now, if we're regularly pruning these plants throughout the months, we're going to constantly have new growth being stimulated, which means we're going to constantly be inviting insects. So what we're trying to uh, share is that just be a little bit more strategic about the way you prune plants. Yes, continue to prune for the health of your plants like roses and fruit trees and other things. But throughout that season, and we can continue to deadhead, but we're really not doing these like shearing or excessive prunings. We hope that makes sense. Yeah, and I do also want to reiterate that you can when in doubt bring in a sample or take a picture and send a sample in um you definitely err on the side of caution because we want to be sure we're not killing off beneficial insects if you do have some insects on your plant you can bring a sample into sloat in a plastic bag that's really important so bring a sample of your fungus or disease or insect in a plastic bag um, to any of our slow uh, locations and we'd be happy to identify for you to be sure. Um, somebody had a question about red spider mites. I've seen those before too, like a, like a billion different, just like tiny little rust colored things moving around. Is that... Uh, is that, do we need to worry about those or what are they? There are, um, there are beneficial spider mites out there and they are beneficial and they're eating other spider mites. 
if we have an excessive amount, like on the walkway or around the pool, I believe that's what the question was saying. Um, it could just be that there was a, um, a bunch of eggs just hatched and that there just happened to be a huge population at that moment. Uh, we could certainly just hose off that patio um, or sweep them away. I know once we start to get into water restrictions, we're not supposed to hose off um, sidewalks or patios. Um, but these are things that we can do to reduce them. But again, I can also share birds are going to come in and eat them. Um, other larger insects will come and eat them. So again, it's part of that ecosystem, although it can be a little alarming sometimes when we see like mass quantities of them. So um, have a little tolerance, maybe just sweep them up or, um, you know, or just notice if they're still there after some time. And then uh, when things seem to go beyond what would be a reasonable threshold, then yeah, reach out, send me another email. Uh, we can, you know, Charlotte and I are in touch with the um, head entomologist for the state of California. So if we can't answer those questions, we have the resources to do so. And unusual weird things pop up all the time. So. <laughs> um. I, maybe I need the, the head entomologist of California on a presentation. That sounds really cool. <laughs> I want to be his friend. Um, okay, so another question is, have you used cloud cover for powdery mildew before, or do you recommend it? Cloud cover is specifically for reducing um, the moisture in a plant from transpiring. Um, I feel like I never, I'm not always saying that word correctly, but it also protects the plant tissue um, when there's frost, just like a, a lip balm would protect our lips from getting chapped if we are skiing or on a sailboat with excessive sun. So it's a plant protector. It is not registered to my knowledge as any type of a pesticide that would control any type of fungal problem or an insect. Now that could be new. So again, the label, if that pest is not on the label, then that product's not going to work for that pest. We always want to read the label, understand what that label says, understand how to apply that product, when to apply that product, what to apply that product on. Label gives us a lot of information. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I understand kind of the thought process behind it because it is sort of coating a leaf, but um, I don't know it either for powdery mildew. So I guess I'll look at the label to be sure next time. Um, a couple more questions. We Again, if we, if we don't get to your questions, feel free to reach out because there's a ton of good questions in here. Um, somebody had a great question about um, coddling malls on apples and pheromone traps. And there's been some research done on using paper bags to cover mm -hmm. developing apples and protect, protect against the second more destructive generation. Any input on this? Um, if you are using paper bags, would they create other issues like molds? I mean, it's, it's a little bit of like a three-part question, um, but I think it's, a, it's an important one, so. Yeah. Um Bagging the maturing apples is very normal and common. It's just time um, intensive. So, and if you have a apple tree that's 20 feet tall, it's not gonna be reasonable. Um, nowadays, modern fruit tree practice for um, the average backyard orchard is to keep our trees small. Dave Wilson Nursery's website has some great videos on how to prune for our backyard orchard culture. Uh, we want to be able to harvest all the fruit or bag all the fruit because we are faced with pest problems. And if we want to reduce using pesticides or avoid using pesticides, then these are, we have to be able to access the tree. Um, there's other products. Um, oh my gosh, there is a beneficial bacteria. I'm sorry, a beneficial fungus called CID X. I think it's CYD dash X, which is a beneficial fungus that the coddling moth larva feed off of similar to the BT for that, um, the white cabbage moth larva, they ingest it and it kills them. It is not toxic. It is um, completely um, inert to anything else. 
It is a little expensive, but if you have a lot of apple trees, it's going to be a really good way to go because you're just using a little bit and you're spraying it on. Um, and I, yeah, I think that's all I can say about the coddling moth. Okay. Awesome. And one last question. Um, I don't think it was in the part about weeds that you talked about, but somebody was asking about corn gluten oh, yeah. for um, killing yeah. off weed seeds. It's a pre-emergent. And so here in the Bay Area, especially the closer you are to San Francisco where the temperatures are more mild throughout the year or more regular, it's the timing is a little challenging. Uh, typically we put pre-emergents out before the rainy season. So with that, um, and we don't always know when the rainy season's going to start, uh, but it can be a very effective, very um, a great pre-emergent that's eco-friendly that we can apply to our gardens to prevent weed seeds from germinating. Great. Well, thank you both so much. This has been such a uh, information-packed presentation and really good information, and uh, really appreciate your time and uh, knowledge and everything. And thank you to everyone that joined us today. Again, uh, we won't have our webinar next weekend um, because of Mother's Day, but then the following weekend we'll have Peppers 101 and we hope to see you there. Uh, it looks like a nice day out today. So it's a good day to get out and enjoy your garden and have a great day. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks everyone.